Wonderful. So glad to see each and every one of you here. And in fact, early, because I know I'm starting like just a few seconds or a minute early. Let's take this morning, even as we are gathered unto the Lord, let's acknowledge that one another, we are also gathered unto the Lord. Let's take this time now, would you stand and go and greet one another. Good morning and also Happy New Year, whatever you wish to. Um, yeah. Go across the room if you need to. Today's a special day. Bless the New Year, brother. Changing, she's changing. The Lord's blessing be with you this new year. Huh? This is my New Year prayer and New Year longing and New Year wish to all of us. But we make it a prayer in the name of Jesus, not just a hopeful wish, but that in Christ we can be He Jia An Kang. We can be a household that is joined together in mind and in heart, each of our households and all of us as God's people. We can experience the peace that we have with God and with one another. And there can be health spiritually and in the body that we still live in today. Would you join me? Let's come to the Lord in prayer today. He's the one who has brought us together here, not just today, but brought us because of His saving work in our life. Holy Spirit, who lives in us, thank you for testifying in our hearts, in our souls, that we belong to you. Oh Father, thank you for your great power and wisdom that you gave Christ for us, for sinners to be saved, to be reconciled, to be redeemed, and to be on a journey of sanctification with you. This day, Lord, may you be praised, may you be glorified through our singing of your word, through our hearing of your word, through our speaking of your word, and through our seeing of your good news in one another's lives. Lord, take your place as the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Take your place and throne in our midst. And you be the one who presides over this entire assembly before you. This we pray together in your mighty and marvellous name. Amen. This morning, our scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians 2. I invite you to read it aloud with me. Let's stand together and read God's word, shall we? One, two, three. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him, these things God has revealed to us through the spirits. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Today, we'll explore this big idea in these four verses 
that the Holy Spirit is the one who tells us who God is and what God is doing. The Holy Spirit enables us to understand and accept Bible truths. I'd like to invite you to sing with me and let's all sing together this song called I Love to Tell the Story. It is the story of the Gospel. It is the story of the entire Bible. There are eight stanzas. This is going to be an epic song, an epic hymn. I invite you to sing out the truths of God's Word today. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all our gold. Tell the story, it'll be 
wonderful things that the Lord has prepared. But by His Spirit we have received His plan to those who love Him. As His plan to those the Holy Spirit has shown us what God has done, is doing, and will do in our lives. And we're glad that we can, we can praise God that He's given us the Holy Spirit to perceive, to understand, and to receive and accept these things. I want to introduce a new song to us today. It's called, The Holy Spirit Fills Me Up. It's a song that uh, even children enjoy to sing. And for this, I'd like to invite uh, our four oldest children to come on board on stage with us. And I want to invite you to learn this song with actions uh, with us. Uh, let's, put, let's put up the next slide first for a moment and let's just walk through the lyrics so that we can um, sing with meaning. Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit fills us up. It fills us up till we overflow from a thimble, a tiny little metal container to a cup, and then from a river to a deep blue sea, the Holy Spirit lives in me. Next slide, please. We'll sing to one another and you can echo this part. Next slide. Um, he lives in me. And then we'll echo, he lives in me. Oh, can't you see? Jesus is love sent from above. And then we point to one another and we say, he lives in you. you. Not in your shoe. <laughs> Jesus is love sent from above. The next Next time we sing this, we'll say Jesus lives, uh, Jesus is love sent from above and the Holy Spirit lives in us, not in a bus. Well, you know why for children's song, they just rhyme the words, right? Okay, let's, let's learn this song together. Watch the four young men and women here who are going to give you the actions and also sing. You'll hear their voices and I'm going to try to get the tempo right for us this time around. Holy Spirit fills me up Fills me up until I overflow From a dimple to a cup From a river to a deep blue sea Holy Spirit lives in me Holy Spirit fills me up Fills me up Fills me up until I overflow From a temple to a cup From a river to the deep blue sea Holy Spirit lives in me He lives in me He lives in me Oh, can't you see? Oh, can't you see? He just is love
now. That was just a warm-up. Now we're going to sing it. We're going to give it all our gusto and claim it and say it as we mean it, right? Holy Spirit lives in each of us who so has placed our faith in Christ Jesus. We're singing a little bit faster. We do the actions and let this be our praise and our glory unto the Lord as well as an encouragement that all of us of every age, intergenerational, from the youngest to the oldest, can worship God together. Here we go. Holy Spirit fills me up. Fills me up until and praise Jesus together. Praise God. Lord, you have sent Jesus and Jesus is your love. Your love demonstrated for us today. Lord, we pray that you will remind every single one of us that this gift of love is meant for us to receive in faith. And that Lord, having placed our faith in you, you walk with us by the deposit of your Holy Spirit as a seal guaranteeing what is to come that we cannot yet understand or see. Lord, help us not just to think about what is going to come in the future, but right now, help us to have spiritual eyes to see what is happening in the spiritual realities today. That though we can see with human eyes, there are things that are happening around us, that you are present, that you are for us, that you are watching and protecting every single person, physically, even by your presence with us. That Lord, the conflicts and the pains that we face in this world today, you are not absent from from us, you're not absent from it, but your hands are moving all things for the good of those who love you, who have been called according to your purpose. This day, Lord, we honour you, we praise you, and we ask, Lord, you continue to keep our hearts open to you so that we may fellowship with you in your spirit as your spirit reveals everything that you want to say to all of us, whether we are children or we are seniors or anywhere else in between. We pray together in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Please be seated. And we're going to collect our tithes and offerings. We're going to give together uh, to God in a moment. I'm going to invite Roy to do that for us. Let us do that together. I trust you have been loved by our Lord Jesus Christ. And even in a new year like that, I'm sure you as parents have been loved, blessed by the giving even in our, by our children. Let us give a wonderful, glorious gift to our Abba Father this morning. I trust that even as all of us seated here are children of God, we can give a gift that blesses our Father's heart. 
I'm sure you experienced that. I'm sure God is pleased when you just give a gift to the Lord. Let me pray. And I want you to prepare your hearts to give, even youngest to the oldest. Come forward and just give a token because you know that it's not even the amount that matters. It is a heart that desires to honour Him. So Lord, we honour You. We honour You, Lord, with our lives. We honour You, O God, with our giving because all things come from You. Much that we have received so much, O God, Your Son, Jesus Christ, the love that has come upon us. We want to love You by our giving. We give thanks to God for our collection. We give thanks to God for that You have given us and given us wisdom in the use of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you come forward? either physically to give your tithes right now or you could do so in electronically I just want to give us an extended time this morning to give a tithe to the Lord now pray a blessing over again the tithes collected and also the children and for our time of learning together we give thanks for the gathering of your people this morning we thank you that we can come because of your grace we thank you God that you have loved us dearly and so right now I think it is just rightful Lord, for your children all of us God to take the time be still, God, in the presence of yours, the Holy Spirit, to reveal the plans of yours, O oh God, for us in our lives, even for our children, as they sit and wait upon you. Bless, Lord, every of our children in the learning and what they, have, what they could learn as your Spirit reveals to them. Give thanks to the Lord for the teachers that you bless them with spiritual words, with spiritual truths that they may understand our children may understand all that you have intended for us this morning. We give thanks for everyone in Jesus' name that, Jesus name that we pray. Amen. May I release the children for your Sunday school? And you have heard us. The text for this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to invite you to open either a physical Bible or have your electronic Bible at hand. And as you do that, I really want to say again, blessed Lunar Chinese New Year to all of you. There has been at least two things that has been our prayer for every one of us in this season, more so in this season of visitation and meeting people. Number one, the prayer has been, Lord, you help us. All that we have learned in our sermon series, all that we have think about, through your scripture, as we talk about the gospel, Lord, help us to speak the truth of Jesus into the everyday stuff of life. I appeal to you even for the rest of today, and then tomorrow, and some of us even in the next 7 or 14 days, these are divine opportunities for us to express our gratitude to God as we think about the truth of Jesus in our life. And I urge you, to take that time to speak about the truth of Jesus in your life. The second, and I think even more importantly that I've been praying for all of us, is that the Holy Spirit will enlighten the hearts of those people that you are speaking to. Because unless the Spirit works in that person's life, we all can hardly understand the gospel truth, less to say to turn our hearts towards Jesus. Any understanding from the gospel comes from the Holy Spirit, regardless of whether you are a believer with us this morning or not. And I'm sure you had an experience of sometimes speaking the gospel, speaking the Bible to one another, and that person seems not to understand it at all. I'm sure you would have experienced even as believers this morning, I could read God's word 
and I could find it hard to understand the point of the passage. So Paul, the pastor, the lead pastor, the founding pastor of the Church of Corinth, would therefore remind the Jewish Christians and the Gentiles Christians alike, because these were people who were seeking to gain enlightenment through human wisdom. But Paul says, them, says to them clearly, it is through the Holy Spirit that God's wisdom and spiritual truths are ever revealed to us. It is the Spirit that gives us an understanding of God's Word. It is the Spirit that moves in our hearts to transform or to even take any action to obey God's Word. I think the relevance for today's text for us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, as Christians, we can easily undermine the important role and the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in all of us. We can easily undermine the important role and power of the Holy Spirit even as we speak the gospel, even as we live a life in the Spirit. Perhaps like the Pharisees, we could read the Bible, understand in our mind without seeking to understand or listen what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us in our hearts. Perhaps like the Gentiles, we could seek to gain enlightenment and sometimes we seek to live our lives through human wisdom. But God has planned and intended so much more than all that we could achieve on our own. God has planned and intended so much that He has given us His Holy Spirit. When Christ ascended, He says, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to live within each and every one of us so that you can know Him intimately so that our hearts can be transformed towards the heavenly things because these are the things that will give us the true delight, eternal delight. So that is the big idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as Paul speaks to Christians. God's wisdom revealed through the Holy Spirit is essential for godly living. God's wisdom revealed through the Scripture, revealed through the Holy Spirit is essential for godly living. Let me invite Eddie up here to lead us in this morning's reading, taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 to 18, and we are reading from the ESV version. Hello, hello. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 to 16. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given as by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is, he, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Thank you, Eddie. Once again, the big idea, God's wisdom, revealed through the Holy Spirit, is essential for godly living. And we see in, in the outline this morning from verse 6 to 8, we're going to understand a bit better about the nature of God's wisdom. From verse 9 to 13, we talk about the revelation of God's wisdom. And in verse 14 to 16, it talks about the necessity of God's wisdom. Father Lord, even as we have read your word, 
and we will affirm God unless your spirit teaches us we know nothing. So Holy Spirit, you who lives in each and every one of us, you who lives in your church, enlighten us please to the mystery and the depth of your wisdom that illumines our hearts, illumines our mind to seek after not just the earthly things, but we will seek after godly wisdom and to live according that you have designed for us. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The nature of God's wisdom. In verse 6, the question that I ask myself, what is the essential nature of God's wisdom? Verse 6 to 7 clearly tells us God's wisdom is eternal. It is for the glory of the mature. Verse 6, it says, the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age are doomed to pass away. In other words, worldly wisdom is not eternal. They are short-lived, they are almost fleeting and momentary. In contrast, verse 7 says God's wisdom is eternal. God's wisdom says that it is decreed, you could say it is predestined before the ages and it shall last for eternity. What Paul is essentially saying in these short verses is that he's reminding us that earthly or worldly wisdom is limited and it is time-bound. They are not eternal. But God's wisdom is eternal. God's wisdom is timeless. It is significant for all ages and for all times. Let us explore this idea a bit as you talk about earthly wisdom with real-life examples. If you consider the advancement of technology, and then this week in my lesson, we will ask, what's the latest model of iPhone? Actually, I don't know. And then I learned that it's iPhone 15. And we ask ourselves, even an iPhone technology itself doesn't last in its function. People are continuously building on an idea and to improve it. Yet you know that the wisdom behind it is limited. You talk about medical science, understanding human and relationship. We have seen scholars developing theories of things in many fields. It is at most, I believe, impressive or useful perhaps for a season. But before long, they are outdated. Before long, they are so much limited in its intent. As we talk about the wisdom of the rulers of this age, well, we have had streams of rulers, rulers, scholarly government people who have come and dictated their wisdom. But once again, you know that their wisdom is again only limited to that age. It is nothing more. I want to point out something important for us to appreciate. We need to know this. All human wisdom or any pursuit of human wisdom will one day come to nothing. All our pursuit of human wisdom will one day come to nothing. In all reality, all that our, we have learned about maybe in our school from science to maths, and then you move on to economics, and you move on to history, geography, arts, music, these things, I may say, does not matter when you see Christ face to face. What is significant, you realize, is not what you have gained in an understanding of worldly literature or wisdom. The question that God will ask us when we see Him face to face, even when we talk about earthly wisdom, God will ask us a simple question, what have you used all the wisdom gained on earth for? Is it for your own glory or is it for His glory? So I'm not discounting that studying is important. Understanding philosophy and wisdom is important. But you must need to understand and see the giver of all wisdom behind all that we are gaining today. But more importantly, when you meet Christ, more significantly, the God that we worship will ask us, do you know me? Do you know my wisdom? And have you lived according to my eternal glorious wisdom? God has decreed a secret and a hidden wisdom of God and God says it is now revealed through Jesus Christ for our glory. It is for your good that God is revealing His mystery, a hidden wisdom of God. So thus to the self-seeking, self-glorifying Jews 
and Greeks in the church then, the wisdom of Christ's crucifixion is an oxymoron. It was inconsistent with their human mind because they were looking for a saviour and they were asked themselves, how can Christ, the anointed Messiah and saviour, therefore be crucified? How can God die? But they didn't understand that God must come in a human form to die for our sin on the cross. Unless Christ died for us, there is no forgiveness of sin. Unless Christ died for us, there is no way we can be reconciled to our holy God. Can you see the mismatch sometimes in human wisdom versus the eternal glorious wisdom of God? Our mind is finite in our understanding. But God has decreed a plan, an eternal wisdom for our glory. So none of the rulers of that age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ was foolishness to them. But to the mature, to the Christians, those who were filled with the Spirit, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, it says. To the mature, Paul imparts, Paul speaks of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me read that again. In verse 7, it is the gospel that was hidden. What it may simply mean, it was previously we could not understand, but now it has been revealed, made known. People of God, it is the gospel that was decreed before the ages for our glory. It was intended by God. It was determined long before creation. God has determined that it shall be revealed. We shall understand. I shall make known the gospel for our glory as Christians. Such is that great honour and privilege for you and I to have the Holy Spirit to understand this glorious wisdom for all of us. But it is as it's written, and here's why he quote Isaiah 64, verse 4, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love Him. In the original text, it says, for those who will wait for Him. These things, Paul says, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that has brought forgiveness, that has reconciled us to God, that has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to all of us, Paul says God has revealed these things to us through the Spirit. Perhaps in today's churches, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit can be underemphasized. Sometimes we could think about God the Father well, we will speak much about Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us. But sometimes we can misunderstand or underrepresent the spirit that is in us. And I'll illustrate that. Well, of course, there are some churches where the spirit can be misemphasized. So Paul speaks about the divinity of the Holy Spirit and its role in verse 10 and 11. And let me go through some of these doctrines because these are important and crucial for our Christian faith. Paul says the Spirit searches, verse 10, searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him, so that no one can comprehend the thoughts of God except the Holy Spirit. So as we think about the second segment from verse 9 to 13, God has given all of us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand, the word is comprehend, God's eternal wisdom. But there are two roles, among many others. There are two works of the Holy Spirit that we must appreciate, at least the character in His nature. Number one, we talk about God, Holy Spirit, is omniscient. In verse 10b, we see that He is all-knowing. The Holy Spirit has a complete and perfect understanding of all things. He says, not only in the present, but much more in the past and then in the future. How come? Because the Holy Spirit, Scripture says, enters into the very depths of God and He will comprehend God's most secret counsel of wisdom. Therefore, the Holy Spirit serves as a divine communicator. 
I could understand what God's word is saying because the Spirit works as a communicator of God's wisdom to all of us. And so he served as an interpreter. God is speaking in a language of a divine nature. How can I understand unless the Spirit interprets His meaning for us? And the Holy Spirit guides us in our thoughts, in our response according to the Scripture. So the Spirit bridges to me the gap between the finite human mind and the infinite wisdom of God. He gaps, He bridges the gap. I believe it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to grasp spiritual truth and then to experience a deeper connection with God. Second of which, He is one with God the Father. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? And so no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. This implies that the Holy Spirit is as much in God as we say a spirit, my, my spirit that lives within me. It is that oneness, it is that intimacy that the Holy Spirit shares with God the Father. It is the Spirit of God that knows the things of God because He is one with God. And so to put it in perspective, when we talk about the triune God, I want to say that the will of the Father, the will of the Son, and the will of the Holy Spirit is one. To help us even understand, talk about our salvation, the will of the Father, the will of the Son, Jesus Christ, and the will of the Holy Spirit is one. But they play on a very distinct role in accomplishing the will of God. What is the will of God? That we all shall be reconciled to Him through repentance. And so God the Father sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross 2,000 years ago. Without that cross, even whatever the Spirit says has no basis. And later on, God gives the Spirit to help us understand, to convict us of God's truth that Christ died, convicts us of our sin, of our righteousness and our judgment in our inner hearts than bring about any change in our lives. And honestly, for all of us, if we talk about salvation, and now we talk about uh, sanctification, it is the same process. Who is the work today? It is the work of the Holy Spirit that is living in all of us today. The work of the Holy Spirit that continues to speak God's truth to all of us, to help us understand and to convict us to will and to act according to His good purpose. So what is my main point? God has given us His Holy Spirit to illuminate God's Word in our hearts. God has given us the Holy Spirit to help us understand and to apply God's Word in our lives. It is what John 16 says, Verse 13 says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, and He has come, the promise of God says He will guide you into all the truth. So the Holy Spirit guides us in all truth. And then in verse 12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, you and I have received the Spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. I want to explicitly mention God's wisdom is primarily expressed in and through the Bible. There is such a cold, strong connection to a fact that has happened 2,000 years ago, Christ. And what is our historical record of that is in the Bible. In fact, many of us would understand the Bible is a revelation of Christ, the one who would display and who would represent all of God's wisdom. Some of us who will understand that all that the Old Testament points to is pointing forward to reveal Jesus Christ. And all that in the New Testament will portray, it will record Christ's life and ministry 
and the author later on, Apostles, will explain its meaning and its implication for godly living. So any revelation, true revelation, understanding of godly wisdom must be founded upon the Bible. Take no second chance about that. So many a times we will say, I ask for prayer requests and as if you are trying to discern a spirit that speaks, of course God can do that. But I want you to know primarily, God has given us every needed wisdom in life to live godly life in and through the Bible. That is why Paul will say the greatest impartation, therefore for all of us, is to speak to teach the Word of God to one another. It is much better than earthly wisdom. And Paul would later keep saying, therefore we will be taught by the Spirit, we will interpret spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. So let us speak the Gospel to one another more than anything else. God's wisdom is revealed through the Holy Spirit as we read God's Word. So maybe as a point of reflection, as we think about the nature of God's wisdom, and also we talk about the Holy Spirit, how has our relationship with the Holy Spirit been in recent times? Well, do we acknowledge the personhood of the Holy Spirit in us? I share a thanksgiving by reminding myself, or at least the scripture enlightens me, by the virtual fact that the Spirit lives in my life, He is fully aware of what you are doing every day. It has helped me at least to be more cautious, even in the actions that I'm taking, even when the thoughts that comes forth, how do I respond? How has our obedience to the Holy Spirit been as He reveals God's truth and instructions to us whenever the Word is preached or even spoken to one another? This obedience, in fact, grieves the Spirit and I want to encourage all of us to strive to align our life with the Spirit's guidance. And so that also means that we need to be in constant fellowship with the Spirit, one form in the reading of God's Word, second of which by prayer, be in connection with the Holy Spirit, be attentive to the voice of God through the Holy Spirit in the Word. Well, He may prompt you to repent. He will prompt you to apologize. He will prompt you to give. He will prompt you to serve. So God's wisdom is revealed through the Holy Spirit as we read God's Word. You ask me, what's the big deal? Then my third point tells us that it is a big deal because in verse 14 to 16, it, sees, it talks about the necessity of God's wisdom for godly living. My assumption is that to any believer, our desire is godly living. So let us see what Paul says. Again, he reinstates the key point that has been saying, the, nat the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. They referring to godly wisdom, these things require spiritual discernment. So to a person who doesn't have the spirit, they cannot discern spiritually. But in verse 15, captures my heart. It talks about the necessity of the wisdom of God because therefore the spiritual person, those that is with the spirit, those that knows God's wisdom, such a person is able to judge all things but is in himself to be judged by no one. What Paul is essentially saying is that the spiritual person, those who possess God's wisdom, in fact, judges all things. Spiritual wisdom is needed in all of our life so that we can judge 
all things. Some Bible version will say so that we can discern all things. Spiritual wisdom is essential because it helps us to discern, to judge that which is of God versus that is not of God. Spiritual wisdom is needed for us to judge that which is good versus that which is evil. Spiritual wisdom is needed for us to judge that it is godly versus ungodly. That which is supernatural of God versus the natural rhymes. That which is eternal in its significance versus that which is temporal. And therefore, spiritual wisdom is essential for living godly lives. We need to know, we need to have God's wisdom because a spiritual person can discern truths against falsehood and deception. So God's wisdom is essential, I believe, especially in the age that we live in. I believe it is a world that is intoxicated with earthly wisdom. This earthly wisdom that captures our hearts, that I may say, that which is temporal, that very often it is of little significance at Christ's second coming. It is often, inverted common, the wisdom that puts us at a point of temptation and giving over to sin, and these things are right at our doorstep by the things that we are seeing in the world that we are living in today. So how do we live godly life, take home with us? You need godly wisdom. Where is our godly wisdom found upon, primarily? in the Bible, revealed by the Spirit. So God has decreed, God has determined, God has given us spiritual wisdom so that we can live godly and holy life. And I want to join us back to our big idea. If we strive to be a godly, a gospel-adorning church, that I mean that our life exemplify the gospel, that by our holy living, reveals a life different from others. We need to pursue spiritual wisdom. We need spiritual wisdom to live our lives each day. James would say, if any of you lacks wisdom, please ask God, because He gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to Him. So I don't have any spectacular <laughs> further instruction then according to what Paul says, that means to us, please read your Bible. Please read your Bible. And each time when you read your Bible, ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate your heart, your mind, to His truths once again. In your time with God in the Bible, in your time in prayer, it is not meant to be a mundane, intellectual enlightenment, may I say that? It is meant for you to rediscover who God is and what God's Word says about the times that we live in. Ask the Holy Spirit to change your life, change all of your hearts to love Him and to worship Him. And so in verse 15, those, the spiritual person, those who possess God's wisdom, therefore would judge us all things, but He Himself is not to be judged by no one, meaning to say, a spiritual person is not subject to mere human judgment. God has moved you beyond the human sphere. For who has understand the mind of Christ so as to instruct Him? But people, Christians, brothers and sisters, let me end off by saying you and I have the mind of Christ. You and I have the mind of Christ because the Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit seeks to reveal God's truth to you through the Bible. He seeks to work in your heart that you might love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Maybe my main point is such is the privilege, maybe the blessing in this season that we are God's children who have the Holy Spirit living in all of us right now. And therefore, we have the mind of Christ. 
God's wisdom revealed through the Holy Spirit is essential, necessary for godly living. The nature of God's wisdom, remember God's wisdom is eternal. It is for the glory of the mature. The revelation of God's wisdom is through the Holy Spirit and the primary source of God's wisdom is relayed through the Word of God which ultimately points us to Jesus Christ through whom all wisdom flows. The necessity of God's wisdom, we need godly wisdom to live godly life. What is your response to God this morning? What is the Spirit laying upon your heart? What has the Spirit spoke to you this morning? I want to emphasize this. God has so much, so much intended for every one of us. God has so much intended. Thus, He gives His Holy Spirit, number one, and He gives His Word to all of us, number two. It's because God the Father, triune God, wants to know you intimately. He wants to transform our hearts and our minds towards the heavenly things because these are the things that will give us true, eternal delight. Let me leave you with that word for this morning and let me pray for all of us. Maybe before we, you know, sometimes just kind of rush off then onto our own agenda for the day. Can I just give you an extended moment of time with the Lord right now? If you're just still trying to figure out, Lord, what are you saying? Then ask of the Lord. God, what is it that I must understand and apply in my life from this morning's word. How is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? Father Lord, like rightly and most probably, the needful thing for all of us is to ask for your forgiveness in any way, known ways, sometimes even unknown, that we have grieved the Spirit within us when we sin against you, God. And we are thankful because the Spirit that lives within us still continues to convict us what is sin, what is righteousness, and what is judgment. Only, Lord, we are pleading with you, Spirit, that you move, Lord, beyond some of this intellectual understanding, that you will move right and through our hearts, Therefore, to respond in surrenderedness to your leading and your lordship. Because, Lord, sometimes the obedience, and I'm glad, God, you have given us also the ability to obey. But I'm learning this week, oh God, that obedience itself can even be an outward conformity without an inward love relationship with you, God. So I'm asking you, Lord, bring us to the point to understand the depth of your love through Jesus Christ. None of us can fully have said comprehend and understood 
your unconditional love on the cross. And therefore, Lord, the Bible remains so attractive, so real in our life when we see the love of Christ and when we see the state that we are all in. We are crying to you this morning, draw us nearer to you, God. Draw us nearer into your presence that we may know the heart of yours, the mind of yours, the will of yours and to live according to your purpose. Father Lord, not leave us please, but continue to work in our life so that we may be used by you, which is a grace. Even in the days ahead, because God, our life is being transformed, imperfect for sure, but transform more and more to be like Christ. We have a gospel to proclaim, O oh God. We give thanks again, God, for this morning. As we respond to you in a song, please continue, Lord, to move us out of our comfort zone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you just please stand with me? reminded today that the Holy Spirit is the one who began our relationship with Christ, with God, by revealing who God is, the wisdom of God, the power of God in Christ Jesus. So the Holy Spirit started your journey and my journey. We're also being reminded that the Holy Spirit is the one who will finish that journey he is the one who is eternal and the one who is preserving us to the day of Christ. But sometimes when we look at the start and we look at the end, we forget the middle. Um, and today we are reminded again that the Holy Spirit is the one who is keeping us in Christ, keeping us in the Lord. We need the wisdom of the Lord. We need the Spirit to speak to us for our everyday lives and for our spiritual lives. Apart from the Spirit, there is no spiritual life. So as Roy invited us, this invitation is to invite our awareness of the Holy Spirit and to submit to Him in His life. Would you make this song a prayer for yourself as much as we encourage you to walk in the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. That's 
shows the path of peace. Turn my striving, yes, Lord. Brief of God, show Christ in all I do. short while we're going to invite you to briefly share with one another and pray what the Lord has been speaking to you through His Word today. But right now also, in this moment, can I invite you to invite the Holy Spirit to begin a reviving, a renewing work in your life, day by day. Lord, leave us not where we are today, but change us from glory to glory by revealing more of the Father by revealing more of the Son by revealing more of your love your wisdom your power to us that we Lord can respond to you cause us to see oh God cause us to hear cause us to perceive let me let you have a few moments to pray like this for yourself in that space in your own context me a new heart, oh God. Wash me afresh each day with your word that cleanses and transforms. Breathe new life that is not just a human life I'm living, a spiritual life. Cause me to hunger for spiritual things, Lord. Cause me to hunger for you. word promises. God speaks himself to say that the Father gives every good gift and that greatest gift he gives is the Holy Spirit. That is the fruit of the gospel. Holy Spirit in us. So Lord, this day we receive. We thank you for your promises, your words that are true. They do not depend on our um, faith alone do not depend on our response but your words are true when you speak it accomplishes what you desire and as we have asked of you to revive us renew us day by day Lord we trust and we 
going to yield, I'm going to submit to you as you do it. For we know it pleases you that your people, uh, we who are called by your name, we who have placed our faith in you, we who follow you, will grow in the likeness of Christ day to day. And now as we spend a moment to encourage one another and to also uphold one another in our faith journey, Lord, let us be your ministers to one another, we pray. Amen. So would we grab the opportunity right now, gathered as His people, just two or three of us together, briefly share a thought that God has laid upon you in the listening and the hearing of His Word for your obedience and life transformation, and then pray for one another as you seal that received Word from God, and we send one another off to continue to follow Him through the course of the week till we meet each other again. Let's take about five minutes for this and then we'll come back with final closing announcements and a prayer and benediction.